Good morning, brethren, sisters, Church of the Living God. Hi. <clears throat> Get your authorized version of the scriptures. And turn in your authorized version of the scriptures to the book of Daniel. This video is going to be for our instruction in righteousness. Something that we all need a, very, a lot of this day and age, right now, today. So many of us. We have to remember something, brethren. No matter how hard it gets for us, we have to cast everything upon the Lord of all. Our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, who can furnish a table in the wilderness. My wife and I, we are prime examples of that. Of how our Lord, through his body, the church of the living God, has provided for us. And on to those of you who have. Especially on uh, yesterday. His timing is so perfect. Thank you. I cannot name those of you. And you know that. Because then you would receive your reward. But the Lord can provide for his own. And will provide for his own. But when you're put in that situation, when the rubber hits the road, that's when we need to remember for our instruction in righteousness, things that have once been and what we are going to face before the redemption of the purchased possession. And also remembering for those Jews during the time of Jacob's trouble, so, with that said, the book of Daniel, chapter 1. Daniel, chapter 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure, into the treasure house of his God. Now, let's remember a few things about King Nebuchadnezzar or King Nebuchadnezzar, the same person, okay? The Lord referred to him as his servant, okay? He referred to Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar, as his servant. He also gave the land of Egypt for wages for his army. He also declared that he gave um, King Nebuchadnezzar his kingdom, okay? We have to remember that about King Nebuchadnezzar. We also have to remember that King Nebuchadnezzar was a pagan. Okay? He used divination. There was, uh, in the book of Isaiah, I believe it is, where it said that he looked into the liver. Okay? Used di divination and magic and that kind of stuff. Okay? But yet, the Lord referred to him as his servant. And of course, in Daniel chapter 4, there is very strong evidence that will tell us that King Nebuchadnezzar is up there in heaven right now. I personally believe that is so as well. But we have to remember that about King Nebuchadnezzar. We also have to remember that before Daniel chapter 4, before the Lord broke him of his pride, that Nebuchadnezzar, because of what the Lord allowed him to do unto his own people, and the uh, power and glory that he gave unto him, we have to remember that King Nebuchadnezzar was a little cocky. Okay? So, keeping that in mind, let's continue. 
And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel, and of the king's seed, and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored, and skillful in all wisdom, and cunning in knowledge, and understanding science, hmm. and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. Now, the children that he's referring to, the children of Israel and of the king's seed, when you trace it back, this traces back onto the prophecy of Isaiah given unto King Hezekiah about how his children will be eunuchs in the land of their enemies, okay? This is a fulfillment of that prophecy given by Isaiah unto King Hezekiah, okay? Verse 5, And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. So these Jews of the king's seed and the princes, children of Israel, these certain ones who what? Children in whom was no blemish. They looked good on the outside. But well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science. Okay? And such as had ability to in them to stand in the king's palace. Okay? And in verse 5 we see what? That the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat. The stuff that he ate and the stuff that he drank. Okay? Keep that in mind. That's going to come up uh, very important here, coming up very quickly. Let's continue. Now among these were of the children of Judah. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. For he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Sidrach, and to Mishael of Mishach, and of Azariah of Abednego. Verse 8. But Daniel proposed in his heart that he would not defend file himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, let's go over a few things here about verse 8. Number one, okay, the literal application, okay, the doctrinal Dispensational, literal application. Okay, number one. Whoop, we have already seen. Daniel and, um, Daniel, Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah, they were what? Jews. And the law, even in captivity, was still binding, was it not? Okay, so, in verse four, well, excuse me, in verse 5, where the king appointed those, these people that were in verse 4, a portion of his meat, they defiled themselves. Why? Because of the kosher laws, okay, which were still in effect, even in captivity, unto the Jew, okay? Okay? They were under the law of their God in captivity. See? even though they were captives in the land of Babylon. Okay? Keep that in mind. Go to Leviticus chapter 3. We're going to go to Leviticus. Go to Leviticus now. Hold your place in Daniel. Go to Leviticus. Okay? Leviticus chapter 3. I'm going to look at one verse in Leviticus chapter 3. Not exit this. Okay? Leviticus chapter 3. Leviticus chapter 3, 
verse 17. You are, of course, well, you are expected to follow me along. Leviticus chapter 3, verse 17. It shall be a perpetual statute for your generations throughout your dwellings that ye eat neither fat nor blood. Okay? Leviticus chapter 7. Leviticus chapter 7, verse 26. Leviticus chapter 7, verse 26. Moreover, ye shall eat no manner of blood, whether it be of fowl or of beast in any of your dwellings. Okay? Now, Leviticus chapter 11. Leviticus chapter 11, verses 43 on to verse 47. Leviticus chapter 11, verses 43 on to verse 47. Ye shall not make yourselves abominable with any creeping thing that creepeth, neither shall ye make yourselves unclean with them, that ye should be defiled thereby. For I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. For I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Separate than, other than. Okay? This is the law of the beasts, and of the fowl, and of every living creature that moveth in the waters, and of every creature that creepeth upon the earth, to make a difference between the unclean and the clean, and between the beasts that may be eaten and the beasts that may not be eaten. Okay? Okay? Now also one more. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 17. Leviticus chapter 17, verses 10 on to verse 14. Okay? Leviticus chapter 17, verses 10 on to verse 14. You there? And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn among you, that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood, and will cut him off from among his people. And remember, being cut off from among his people is means that cut off, meaning risk their salvation. Okay? Because the circumcision made without hands wasn't there. Body and soul were connected. Okay, that's what that means. Okay, I've already covered that in a video, in a few videos actually, but I'm not going to go off on that. Let's continue. Verse eleven: For the life of the flesh is in the blood, the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood, not the flesh that maketh an atonement for your soul. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, No soul of you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger that sojourneth among you eat blood. Notice that it says any soul. Okay, because again, the circumcision made without hands which is the death, burial, and uh, resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shed his blood on the cross to make perfect atonement for our sins, where animal blood covered sin. Didn't do away with it. Okay? Okay? <clears throat> where were we? Oh, yeah, we finished verse 12. <laughs> Beg your pardon. Verse 13. And whatsoever man there be of the children of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn among you, which hunteth and catcheth any beast or fowl that may be eaten, he shall even pour out the blood thereof, and cover it with dust. For it is the life of all flesh, the blood of it is for the life thereof. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, 
Ye shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh. For the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. Whosoever eateth it shall be cut off. Cut off mean lose their salvation. Okay? Cut off. Just cut you off. You're done. Okay? Remember, under the dispensation of the law, okay, they can make that right again, of course. Okay? But you got to remember, eternal security was not available under the law. Okay? It was faith and works. Okay? You got to remember that. Okay. And also, too, here's something very interesting. Go to First Corinthians, uh, First Corinthians, chapter ten. First Corinthians, chapter ten. This, this you'll find very interesting too. First Corinthians, chapter ten, verses nineteen under verse twenty-two. Verse nineteen under verse twenty-two in First Corinthians, chapter ten. What shall I say then? That the idol is anything? Or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, which the Babylonians were, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? So now, with that in mind, the portion of the king's meat and the wine which he drank, King Nebuchadnezzar, bloop, hello. He was a pagan. Uh, I could bet you a whole lot of money that he did not keep kosher because the dietary laws were for the Jews under the law. Okay? So one can logically come to the realization that the meat that the king was eating and that these other children in verse 5, okay, uh, verse 4 and verse 5, that the king gave unto them was not kosher meat. For all we know, they probably ate blood. They probably were given unclean things. But because they feared Nebuchadnezzar more than proposed in their heart to follow their Lord under the circumstance like Daniel did, they were defiled. Now, do you already see where we're going to go with the instruction in righteousness? You do, do you not? Yes, you do. For our instruction in righteousness, what can we learn from this? Well, thanks, Mark. If you don't, you won't be able to work. You won't be able to buy food. It's slow going right now, but you know, the shot. It's funny. My wife left her job of umpteen years because they were forcing her to get the flu shot. And they said to her, if you don't get the flu shot, you ain't got no job. My wife's like, I'm out of here. And then as she has come to learn that where she used to work, they're not forcing the vaccine for the uh, poison crown on their employees. But yet they forced the flu shot? See, not yet. See, it's not yet. That will be coming. Forcible vaccinations. Oh, oh, you bet your bottom dollar, boy. That is coming. But not yet. Because why? Too many people are up to that. Too many people. It's like, I'm not going to take that thing. 
See, the Jesuits have to make you more terrified of this monster that is the deadliest plague known to mankind. They have to make you a little bit more askirt. Okay? And they're going to. Okay? But the provision of the king's meat. In order to what? Verse 4 and 5. Children in whom was no blemish, but well favored, and skillful in all wisdom, and cunning in knowledge, and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat, and of the wine which he drank. So nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Nourishing them three years with what can logically be assessed that they were being given unkosher meat, most likely eating uh, flesh with the blood in it, in order that they may be able to stand in the presence of the king. I don't, we don't really have to go much further for the instruction in righteousness, right? You want to survive, right? You want to, you want to provide for your own? Then compromise, right? Then compromise. If any man provide not for his own, but yet they make you... <laughs> and when you look in Leviticus chapter 13, dear friend, the only, what, according to the scripture... If someone is to be isolated, it's the sick, and it's to be above their upper lip, not their nose. Okay? And those who were sick were the ones to be isolated. See, herein lies the rub. Is this your standard? Are you, church, look, look at me, look at me. Are you, Church of the Living God, truly living this as your standard of practice? Show me in the New Testament where that is undone, that was given in Leviticus chapter 13. Hmm? Hmm? The method for dealing with that is given in Leviticus chapter 13, and it is nowhere undone. Hence, that's the way, according to Scripture, you handle such things. Very scientific, the Scriptures are, dear friends. But see, they have you thinking that, you know, in order to survive, to provide, you have to compromise and go against what the scripture says in order for you to provide. Come on. Do you really think the Lord is going to honor that when you go against his word? Claiming. Scripture yourself. I have to provide for my own. By compromising what is written in his own word? Oh, brother, sister. I'd be careful with that. I would really be careful with that. At the end of the day, that is between you and the Lord. And remember, too, the Lord is not forcing you to do anything, is he? No. But think about it. Who would he rather have you obey? Man or himself? Especially what man is telling you goes against science, which the scriptures are scientific. Okay? Follow them or follow the Lord? You don't think the Lord is gonna could provide for you? Did, did, 
Okay, now stop. How many of you say, oh, I know, but shh. What happens when you are forced to put your put the rubber to the road? As I was. The Lord took me out of the secular workforce. When I was a skirt, oh I was. All of a sudden, you know, a move happening and all this stuff. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. He took me out of the one to put me into another. And it's like, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'm going to do it. Don't think he can provide for you. Now, get, get your butt out of the way. You know, cast all your care upon him for he careth for you, right? Who do you fear? Let's continue. Let's reread re verse 8. Beg your pardon. But Daniel proposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat. You got to you got to propose in your heart, settle it. No matter what happens. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. But Daniel proposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. Now think about verse 9. In contrast to verse 8, he proposed in his heart, Lord, no matter what happens, I, I ain't going to... I ain't going to go with these rules in captivity. See, we are in the world. We are not of the world. Remember? Remember? Okay? Yes, we are to obey the rules of man for conscience sake. Yes. But when the rules of man contradict the scripture, what do you do? What do you do, dear friend? What do you do? Do you propose in your heart that you will not defile yourself with the portion of the king's meat? And who is this king? For our instruction in righteousness. Well, we're going to be looking at that, that verse. But who is the king of this world? King over all the children of pride? Who is the little G, God of this world? Who has been given reign on this world for judgment? You know the answer to that, don't you? Uh, if you don't, that's the loose that's Lucifer, that old devil, the serpent. Satan. Okay. Man's laws contradict the scripture. What do you do? And because Daniel proposed in his heart, in captivity, our instruction in righteousness again, brethren. We are in the world, we are not of the world. What do you propose in your heart to do? Oh, I'm going to go ahead and compromise and do go against what the scripture plainly says and use the excuse of providing for my own. What about starting your own business? Hmm? What about working for yourself? Stuff like that. Well, you don't think the Lord can provide for you? And because Daniel proposed in his heart that he would not defile himself, that he would remain Faithful to the Lord, even under captivity. 
Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of his un of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king. And we're going to see, <laughs> yeah, yeah, because before King Nebuchadnezzar was broken and humbled of his pride, uh, he, 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 you should have been terrified of this guy. Absolutely. Who hath appointed your meat and your drink? And why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall ye make me endanger my head to the king, thinking of his own hide. And you, you, you just read the verse yourself. Like, why should I do that? Because he's going to he's going to notice. He's going to notice a difference. Did you catch that in that verse? For why should the, he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Now, this guy was thinking that they were going to look a lot worse than the ones who were being defiled by the king's meat. But the point is, uh, obviously there's going to be a difference, isn't there, from someone who is going to defile, be, allow themselves to be defiled by the king's meat because they fear the king rather than the Lord. See? In this verse is given unto you that there's going to be a difference. But this guy is putting the difference in the worst liking rather in the blessing of those who go along with what the Lord says. Do you get it? You, you get that, right? It's pretty simple, isn't it? Let's continue. Verse 11. This is, this is beautiful. This is very beautiful. Then said Daniel to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, and Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Prove thy servants. I beseech thee ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. What is pulse? Like green beans, beans, seed plant, that kind of stuff. Uh, the Bibles like to say vegetables. It's dead. It says pulse in the scriptures. Okay? Pulse. Likened on the green beans and bean plants and stuff like that. Okay? He would, they would have, uh, he said, prove thy servants, I beseech thee ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink, rather than eating the portion of the king's meat and drinking the wine which he drank. For all we know, the wine could have had blood in it. Okay? Okay? And also, this kind of hints at having food and raiment therewith, let us there be let us therewith be content. What is it profited to a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? We're, we're gonna look at that, I think. I think I wrote that down in our in the verses we're gonna be looking at. Okay. He would rather eat pulse than dine on the banquet of a pagan king who is giving him food. Come on! That was obviously not kosher, according to the scriptures. See, Daniel, under all these circumstances, stuck to his guns, stuck to the Lord, and didn't say, yeah, but, yeah, but I'm in captivity. Yeah, but I got to do this. Yeah, but. No, he stuck to the Lord. Verse 9, now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. In fulfillment of scripture, where uh, our Lord says, if they humble themselves in the land of their enemy, that he will show them mercy in the land of their enemy. Okay? Let's continue. Verse 13. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. A visible difference between those who compromise and those who do not. Oh, yeah, boy. 
Oh, yeah, boy. Uh-huh. Those who are Christians, who look like the world, think like the world, act like the world, talk like the world, because they compromise and go along with the prince of the power of the air. You know, the king today, who's allowed that by our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, versus those who, no matter what it's going to cost me, Lord, I'm going to stick to the book. See. Verse 13 again, Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. A notable, a noticeable difference. What makes you different, brother, sister? It's the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, that dwelleth within you, that seal, the Holy Ghost, and the Lord is that spirit. Okay? And when you are obedient unto the scriptures and obey him, don't eat that, don't do that, don't do this, don't do it. You do that again, I'm going to hurt you kind of stuff, okay? Instead of being one of these guys who just goes on living like the world and their life is a wreck. It's going to be a noticeable difference between those who compromise and those who don't. Those who make excuses, which lost people do, rather than those who say, no matter what it goes, it's going to cost me. Everything. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. But how many of you compromise in that? Huh? Verse 14. So he consented to them in this matter. And prove them ten days. And like, all right, buddy. And at the end of ten days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat of the portion of the king's meat. There was a visible difference. At the end of the ten days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than the children which did eat of the portion of the king's meat. Because he didn't compromise and stuck to his Lord, stuck to his guns. While the others, out of fear, not an excuse, but they were afraid, and they compromised. And it was a visible difference. Now, what's the visible difference between some of you of the church of the living God and then say, well, I have to do this because no one sits me. Do you realize when you put that thing on, you look just like the world right now? Do you realize when you allow yourself to watch things of the world, listen to things of the world, that you dress as if you are of the world? Sisters, Dress like ladies. Brethren, dress as men. We are supposed to be different, right? And what we're learning right here, there was a visible difference. But see, this visible difference came from what? Verse 8, Daniel proposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat. The day that I lost my job, because I was a monkey in the wrench, a pain in the buttocks, a burr under the saddle, 
as I have been referred to, a pest. I wouldn't keep my mouth shut. And it was, I lost my job because of it. And I was, I was scared. Of course I was. But I proposed to my heart. You're in control, Lord. I'm going to do what you say. You do have faith, right, on our Lord Jesus Christ? Verse 16. Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they did that they should drink and gave them pulse. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, then the... The prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king communed with them. And among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. So among all those of the children of Israel that compromised and ate of the king's meat, rather than these four that stuck to their guns, that clave unto their Lord, the ones who risked everything to cleave unto their Lord, were the ones that were preferred. I'm not saying. I'm just saying. See. Verse 20. We're going to finish this whole chapter. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. And Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. Now, oh, beg your pardon. Let's go to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3 is where King Nebuchadnezzar, his, his pride was reaching its apex, okay? King Nebuchadnezzar's pride got the very best of him in Daniel chapter 4 when the Lord's like, okay, I, you, you, I called you my servant, okay? You, okay, who do you think you are, okay? You know, lest the enemy exalt himself saying, by my power I have done this? No, no, no. But we're going to see here in Daniel chapter 3, okay? In Daniel chapter 3, another example of those who stuck to their Lord, stuck to their guns, okay? Now, this is about the image that Nebuchadnezzar set up. And you, you parents who have kids, you kids watching this, go like this, okay? The golden image, okay, the Nebuchadnezzar, uh, where is it, made an image of gold. That's the very first verse, an image of gold. This image of gold was an obelisk. An obelisk is, kids, parents, an obelisk is a male phallus. An uncircumcised male phallus. Golden. And you have to remember the masons in this. Okay? Masonry. The woman, the man. Okay? And then you put the line in there. You have the seal of Solomon. The star of Remphan. Not the true flag of the children of Israel. Okay? But that's what you get, the mason sign with the line between them, okay? And that G in the middle there stands for generative principle, okay? Or generativity. Because you got to remember, the masons wear that loincloth over them. 
not to symbolize that they were Masons, no, because of the golden phallus of Horus. And you can, you can learn about that by researching what Manley Palmer Hall said about that, okay? The golden phallus of Horus, okay? And what is Horus? Isis, Horus, Set. IHS. Hmm. Hmm. Who, uh, who uses IHS? Oh, yeah, the Jesuits. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. So King Nebuchadnezzar made a golden phallus. All right. And he had, you know, anyone who heard the sound of the, the flute, sect, but harp, that kind of stuff, were supposed to bow down to an uncircumcised phallus. Yeah. Let's pick this up in Daniel chapter 3, verse 8. Okay, Daniel chapter 3, verse 8. <clears throat> Wherefore at that time certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, with a K, shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the providence of Babylon. Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Now for our instruction in righteousness. When you compromise and go against God's word, the Holy Scriptures, the authorized version, who are you bowing down to when you choose the fear of man over the fear of the Lord? Who are you bowing down to? And right now, right now, brother, sister, how imperative is it of us, the Church of the Living God, to make this stand, no matter what it costs? Because think beyond yourself for a minute. Because when the redemption of the purchased possession happens, the catching away, falsely referred to as the rapture, okay? The testimony we leave behind for these people. What's your testimony going to be like to the people who are left behind? One of compromise? That's what these coadjutors, these easy believism heretics are doing. Not that they are compromising. No, they, they never were of the Church of the Living God. But they are leaving a deluded um, testimony of compromise. What about you, brother and sister? What about you? Talk about the fear of man, huh? When it comes upon you, as it did to me, as it did to my wife. As it also has come, perhaps, onto those who I love very dearly of the Church of the Living God. I know of a brother who, whose bloodline I share 
has is oh I can, this dear brother who, of whom I refer um, who has proposed in his heart not to defile himself and what that dear young sweet brother goes through I can't even imagine I can't even imagine but see that that brother and you know who you are he has proposed in his heart that he's going to keep himself pure. In the area and direction that the Lord is leading him, I can't even say that. He's quite a man. <laughs> he really is. But let's continue, okay? So these guys went and snitched on the Jews for not bowing down to a golden phallus. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. The moment of truth. Moment of truth. What were they going to do? What are you going to do when you're brought before the king, Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and his fury? What did these guys do? You know this. You know this. But let's really look at it. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbuck, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, with a K, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made, well, but if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And look, look at this. Remember, our Lord referred to King Nebuchadnezzar as a servant. He gave him the land of Egypt for wages for his army. He allowed King Nebuchadnezzar. To virtually destroy his people. And this King Nebuchadnezzar, I believe, is in heaven. But look at this. Look at that. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Sounds very reminiscent to um, Rabshakeh, who went before Hezekiah. Doesn't it? Now think about that. Compromise. Take something that you know is poisonous and that is killing people. Or else. But if you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Play ball. Or lose everything. And right now, like I said, forcible vaccinations are not being enforced yet. But they will. They will. And you devils, if you have half the stones that you claim you do, you would admit to that as well. Sorry for using that analogy, people. Make a part. Verse 16. What did they decide to do? Who did they fear? Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. 
if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. With your place, go to Exodus chapter 34. Exodus chapter 34. Exodus chapter 34, verse 6 under verse 17. Exodus 34, verse 6 under verse 17. Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 under verse 17. And the Lord passed by before him, and uh, Moses, and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Notice gracious, okay, followed by long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Verse 7, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will, will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. That's a very good definition of what grace is, isn't it? And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. And he said, if, I, if now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us. For it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for thine inheritance. Verse 10, And he said, Behold, I make a covenant before all, the, all thy people, and will do marvels, such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord. For it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. Observe thou that which I command thee this day. Behold, I drive out before thee the Amorite, and the Canaanite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whither thou goest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. Our instruction in righteousness. Don't compromise. Do not conform. Stick to your guns. Stick to the word of God, the authorized version of the scriptures. Cling on to the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, for he is our life. He is our all. Don't compromise. Verse 13. But ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. For thou shalt worship no other god. That no other god means also yourself. For the Lord whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. See, lost people can't understand that our God is jealous. How many people say, well, how can God be jealous? Uh, God made you because he wanted to. And for his pleasure, all things were created. That's found in the book of Revelation. You go find that yourself, okay? Why did God make you? Because he wanted to, because he felt like it. 
because he had pleasure to do so. Okay? Hence, you're his. Whether you want to accept that or not. That doesn't mean that you're right with him and saved. Okay? But he made you whether you want to accept that or not. Hence, when he made you to have fellowship with him and you go and whore yourself to something other than he, what? What? You and I as man, as fallible man, have the right to be indignant about petty little things and he who created us has not? See, lost people understand what jealousy is. But they can't equate it to God because they are their own God. And they've compromised. Haven't you? Verse 15. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go a whoring after their gods, and do sacrifice unto their gods, and one call thee, and thou eat of his sacrifice. Hello, what did we just look at in Daniel chapter 1? And thou take of their daughters unto thy sons, and their daughters go a whoring after their gods, and make thy sons to and make thy sons go a whoring after their gods. Thou shalt make thee no molten gods, Catholic. Like the golden phallus. Go back to Daniel chapter 3. Let's reread verse 16 on to verse 18. Beg your pardon very quickly, brethren. Okay. Sorry about that. If you just saw me bl blow my nose, I, I do apologize. I do apologize. Verse 16 on to verse 18. Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury and the form of his visage was changed against Sadrach, Meshach and Abednego when you stick to our Lord and blatantly defy what they tell you to do that is contrary to the scriptures oh you'll see that in a lot of these professing Christians You'll see that a lot. Those who are, what, what do they call you? Bible thumpers? Uh, I prefer a scripture thumper. Yeah, of course, obviously. Amen, buddy. Amen. I am a scripture thumper. Amen. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake, and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them in, into the burning fiery furnace. Don't be surprised about the fiery trial that is to try you as though some strange thing has happened unto you. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, and their hats, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So intense, like it says, the guys who cast them in there, they got, they got killed. 
Okay? That's how intense Nebuchadnezzar's fury was. That's how intense Satan is against you, Church of the Living God. When you don't compromise, when you fear the Lord more than men. Verse 23. And these three men, Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound in the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. I love this. Then, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astoned and rose up in haste. Whoa, what? And spake and said unto his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Um, what does that mean? That's the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Right there with these three uh, men in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. These three. Verse 18. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. These three did not compromise. And they weren't going to worship the gods of this world for our instruction and righteousness. They counted their, they didn't count their own lives dear unto the very death. But chose to do that which pleases the Lord. And the Lord was with them in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And then... After that, King Nebuchadnezzar was obviously extremely impressed. Hence, they gave a really good testimony onto him. Hence, we sticking to the scriptures, trusting on our Lord, no matter the fiery trial that is to try us for sticking to the scriptures, cleaving on to our Lord, Oh, what a testimony it's going to be unto them. Look at verse 29. Uh, look, no, verses 28 on to verse 30 now. And remember that the fire never hurt these guys that were in the fiery furnace because the Lord was with them in the fiery furnace. The smell of smoke didn't pass on them. Nothing was singed or burnt up. They came out as if nothing happened, even though they were tried in fire. They came out shining like gold, boy. Verse 28 on to verse 30. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word, and yielded their bodies, that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other God that can deliver after the sort. Then the king promoted Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the providence of Babylon. They were rewarded for sticking to the Lord, for cleaving on to him under extreme adversity, no matter what it costs them. You, 
You get that point, of course. Are you going to defile yourself with the king's meat? Hmm? Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6, let us read, beginning at verse 1 on to verse 17. Daniel chapter 6. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom an hundred and twenty princes, which should be over the whole kingdom. And over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should re receive, and the king should have no damage. Excuse me. So kind of like a system of government where the, you know, people went to these guys and then they went to the king. Okay. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Now, let's stop real quick and put this into the equation. Okay. Of these presidents and princes of the kingdom, they were what? Most likely Persians and Medes. And here is an outsider, a Jew, set over them, preferred above them. In contrast, Darius preferred a Jew to be head over these people than one of his own people. Yeah, roll, roll that one around in your head for a little bit and chew on that one, huh? Okay? Do, do you think there might have been a little envy on the part of these Persians and Medes against Daniel, a Jew? Not of their own, who was set above them? Oh. Let's say the scripture. Let's keep reading. Verse 3, uh, verse 4, excuse me. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could but they could find none occasion or fault, for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, because he was blameless. He feared the Lord, and because he feared the Lord, that brought him in tender love and care for whoever it was who was in charge. Darius, Nebuchadnezzar, Belteshazzar, okay, Darius, and Cyrus. Four, okay, at least four kings we know that Daniel st stood before because he had proposed in, him, in his heart not to defile himself with the king's meat. He feared the Lord, not men. Verse five again. Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against Daniel, against us, Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Then these presidents and princes assembled to the, together to the king, and said, and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors, the princes, the counselors, and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whomsoever shall ask a petition of any God, see that's capital G there, okay? They start with any God. Or man for 30 days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, 
Here are these guys, obviously moved with envy for reasons already explained. Okay, so they go and they go up brown nosing King Darius. King Darius, you know, he, he, he didn't see what was coming, obviously. Okay? And, and if you, and we're not going to read this whole chapter, okay? But um, King Darius, for what, for all things, intentions and purposes, he was a righteous ruler. For all intentional purposes, yes, he was, all things considered, okay? But they kind of come brown nosing to him, sucking up to the king. Uh, kind of the end justifies the means in a way to gain the king to their favor and to, in essence, trick the king. King Darius didn't see it coming. But we're going to see that he realized these guys, these guys pulled something off. Let's continue. Verse 8. Now, O king, see, they come here. If anyone does any positions of any god, they mention that first, capital G, go to men first. They were puffing this guy up, King Darius, right? See? False flattery, building you up so they can attain their own malicious deeds. Boy, that sounds like some people I'm aware of. Now, O king, verse 8. Establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Why not? Verse 10. Verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed. Stop. I beg your pardon. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed. He wasn't ignorant. What was this decree? that whosoever shall ask a petition of any God, capital G, or man, for 30 days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. That was the decree. Daniel knew that. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did a fourth time. Now, the instruction in righteousness. What happens when they tell you you can't worship the Lord publicly? What happens when they start arresting you and silencing you for staying true to the Lord and speaking the word of the Lord out there? You know, the scriptures. What happens when it becomes against law for you to testify of our Lord Jesus Christ? What happens when they make it a law that no one can do anything unless they first go on to the Pope? Huh? What are you going to do? Hmm? What are you going to do? When you know that the writing is decreed, what are you going to do? You can't say that. You can't talk like that. You can't put the tracks on cars. You can't speak to people. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Verse 10 again. 
Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed, and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Hold your place here. Go to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. Verses 1 on to verse 6, Exodus chapter 20. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Our instruction and in righteousness, Egypt is the lost world which our Lord redeemed us out of. Okay, and Pharaoh is a type of Satan, okay, for our instruction and in righteousness. You already know that. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Little G. Thou shalt, and here's <laughs> uh, the graven images which the Catholics take out and they make the covet two commandments when it's only one. They make the tenth, the ninth, and they get rid of this one so they can have their graven images. Yeah. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers unto the children, unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and shewing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Uh, verse 3. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The little g. And what they did here in Daniel, go back to Daniel, was elevating Darius above God in order to catch and trap and get rid of Daniel who clave to his God. Do you get it? So what does this mean? That the Jesuit-run governments will do things purposely to get those of us authorized uh, scripture believers, authorized version scripture believers, out of the way? They will do things purposely to make it a crime for us to do as we would out of fear of the Lord? You don't think that's coming, huh? As a brother has mentioned to me, it's like, I hope we're out of here before that happens. Yeah, brother, me too. Me too. But we don't know, do we? And when you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, But, okay, now we saw that. Darius, in his own, was kind of, he was ignorant. He didn't know what these guys were planning. He should have put two and two together, you know, exalting me over any god, right? And that he wasn't, um, and that he was guilty, but, you know, he should have put two and two together and, and come up with four instead of 36, right? Let's continue. Verse 11. And see, verse 11, now Daniel, no matter what, he continued to pray unto the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Okay? One and the same. And these men, then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. They watched him like the devils do to those who are of the church of the living God. They watch you. And then what do they do immediately? Go to the king. Then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any god or man within 30 days, save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? See, they're trickery. They, they did that with the point in order to catch Daniel like we have already seen. See? 
And the king answered and said, The thing is true. According to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Then answered they and said before the king, That Daniel. Uh, note that these guys are accusing the righteous, like the accuser of our brethren, the accuser of the brethren, Satan, and all his little wicked devil coadjutors out there. Yeah, that's all they can do is accuse. That's all they can do. Then answered they and said before the king, that Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee. Now, instruction and in righteousness of the captivity of Judah. Again, the princes, the sheriffs, the captains, and whatnot, the presidents, were of Darius's own. While Daniel, a Jew, was elevated above them. Our instruction and in righteousness. They are of the world. We are not of the world. They are of the world, they for, therefore they hear the things that are of the world. Those that are of God hear God's words that come from his body, the church of the living God. Do you get it? Yeah? Uh-huh. So they're accusing us like, see, they're, they're not like us. You see? Let's continue. O king. Okay, wait. Then answered they and said before the king, that Daniel, which is, of, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, we are in the world, not of the world, regardeth not thee, O king, nor decree, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. Now think about this. You are not thinking of the common good, right? Right? They say to you, you don't wear a face mask, you don't get the poison, okay? You don't do that ridiculous whatever, okay? You don't do any of that. You're the bad guy. You're the bad guy. And, and who's the ones telling you that? Christians, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, Christians. Christians are the ones telling you that. Church of the living God. How, you know, yeah, you get it from a lot of lost people. But when you talk to some of these people who act like an imbecile because you're standing by the scriptures, it's like, oh, I'm a Christian. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, yes. Yes, you are, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. It is true. Brethren, the most ferocious attacks that will ever come to you are from those that claim that they are of the church of the living God, yet are rather Christians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they call you the bad guy. Christians call you the bad guy. Or the bad woman. Because you're, you fear the Lord. And they twist it. And they call good evil and evil good. And you're evil. <laughs> or doing this. Or re doing whatever. Yeah. Yeah. When all of that is contrary to the scripture. Let's continue. Verse 14 is where King Darius is like, Oh, no. Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased in himself. Oh, you guys tricked me. Oh, what an idiot I was. Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Verse 15. 
Take a note of this. Then these men assembled the accusers of the brethren. Then these men assembled unto the king and said unto the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and Persians is that no decree nor statute which the king establisheth may be changed. Uh, we have no king but Caesar using the, mil the um, government to do their dirty work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, note verse 15. These guys were saying to the king that no law that the king passes can be changed. Saying that to the king who established this decree. Now, think about that. Hold up. Think about that. Back in this time. That even the king himself who established that decree in writing couldn't overrule what he himself decreed. Okay? What does that tell you? That the laws of the Medes and Persians was very much ironclad. But yet, how many out there who call themselves Christian take this and just whoo -hoo, in the name of compromise? Huh? Look at America. Our Constitution means nothing. It's guidelines at the very best because of the Trading with the Enemy Act, okay? Because of Roosevelt, the state of emergency that was never rescinded. Barack Hussein Obama, he talked about it but never did it, okay? <clears throat> Ever since what, the 30s or whatever it is, I got all the information, but I, I haven't looked at it for a while. But Ever since the 30s, America has been in a state of emergency. You know, the, the golden fringe around some of the flags and stuff like that. That means that the president as sovereign, similar to the hierarchy of Roman Catholicism, okay, uh, has the power to override the Constitution for the common good. Whereas the laws of the Medes and Persians not even the king himself could change. And yet you got these Christians out there who change God's word. They change it into a lie. You know, the NIV, Johnny Boys and Justin, Justin's precious New American Standard, them two devils, huh? The English Standard Version and so on and so forth. Yeah. 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 Isn't it any wonder, brethren, that the greatest opposition that we face are from these Christians? And you wonder why I am adamant on referring to us as the church of the living God, the ground and the pillar of the truth, and not going by the name that they gave unto us. It's not a big deal. <laughs> I beg to differ. Well, let's continue. Verse 16. Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that, he, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Then if we were to continue reading, King Darius is all busted up about it. He spends the night fasting and in concern for Daniel. And the first sign in the morning, he goes to the uh, den of lions and he asks him, and he's like, oh, Daniel, are you okay? Did your God protect you? Okay. Verse 21. Then said Daniel unto the king, 
O King, live forever. Verse 22. My God has sent his angel and has shut the lion's mouths that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him innocency was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. And Darius knew that. And Darius was happy about that, of course, obviously. And then, let's read to verse 24. Then was the king exceedingly glad for him, and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no manner of hurt was found upon him, because he believed in his God. He trusted on the Lord to get him out of the lion's den. When all Daniel did was propose in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's meat. And you know the snare that the enemy will lay for you, hoping to trap you? They'll fall in it to the, in themselves. They'll fall into their own pit that they have dug for themselves. Yeah. And the king commanded, and they brought those men which had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives. And the lions had the mastery of them, and break all their bones in pieces, or ever they came at the bottom of the den. Uh, before, their, before they hit the bottom, the lions, boom. That's the fate of all you devils. And woe be to you that you know that. And you continue on in evil. <sighs> See, brethren, go to Luke chapter 4. We have to remember the little G God of this world. Okay? Go to Luke chapter 4. Okay? Luke chapter 4, verses 5 and 7. Luke chapter 4, verses 5 and 7. On to verse 7. And the devil taking him up, our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, into an high mountain, shewed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them. For that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. And remember how our Lord rebuked the first Pope about, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest the things that be of men, not of God. Okay? What? Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest the things that be of men, not of God. Uh, savorest the things that be of flesh, of man. I will be like the Most High. See, you worship yourself or anything else but the Lord, you are serving Satan. I'm, I'm going to come right out and say it to you. You're going along and not trusting on our Lord and doing all this nonsense that they're telling you. You're serving the devil. I ain't saying, Church of the Living God, I ain't saying that you're lost. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that your compromise is going on to the devil. Go to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. Okay? Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, verses 14 on to verse 20. Mark chapter 4, verses 14 on to verse 20. Okay? The parable of the sower. The sower soweth the word. That's you and I, Church of the Living God. 
And these are they by the wayside, where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately, and taketh the word that was sown in their hearts. Okay? You're out there, here, sowing the word, the authorized version of the scriptures. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. Yea, hath God said? That's not an accurate translation. God would want you to think of the common good and go ahead and conform. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground who when they heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, I'll take that track. Sure, I'll believe in Jesus, sure. And have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, Immediately they are offended when the rubber hits the road. Absolute suffering reveals, and absolute suffering reveals absolutely. See, you, you, any of you who have, who have proposed in your heart not to be defiled by the king's meat and said, I am going to live by the scriptures no matter what it costs me, and then persecution comes. All who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, okay? You live according to the scriptures, you're going to get persecuted. You're going to be accused by devils, okay? And those who are so happy to hear the word of God, but yet once they receive persecution for it, they fall back because their heart, because of the heart, is not converted unto the Lord. Their heart wasn't converted. And don't give me that nonsensical argument, well, the Lord knows my heart. Yes, he sure does. Yes, he sure does. And he knows that it's wicked. But is it broken and is it contrite? That's the thing. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word. And the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things enter in and choke the word. And it becometh unfruitful. I gotta go against the scriptures. I go. I gotta do this because it says I gotta provide for my own. Amen. It does say that. Yes, it does. Amen. But would God have you to compromise His word in order to do that? Would the Lord, to you who are a woman, a sister, would the Lord be okay with you whoring yourself out for money in order to provide for your son or your daughter? Do you think he would be okay with that? Well, I got to provide for my own, so I'm going to go sell myself. Hmm? You might be saying that's not the same thing. Yes, it is. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. Who do you fear? Verse 20. 
And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it, and bring forth fruit, some thirty, some sixty, some an hundred. And receive it. Stand to it, no matter the cost that you propose in your heart that you're not going to be defiled with the king's meat. And who is this king of this world today? Oh, he is a king over all the children of pride. Who might that be? Go to 2 Corinthians. I know you've probably been waiting for this, right? 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verses 1 on to verse 4. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. What does that mean? But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. What does that mean? Walking your talk. Walking according to the scriptures. Conforming your life to the word of God. That's what that means. Okay? But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Lost. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on to them. Who is the image of God, should shine on to them. Those who are lost won't hear it. It's up to the Lord to water that seed. But there are those out there who, when you, as we looked at in Mark chapter 4, okay, there are those out there who hear it and just Satan takes it away. Be yeah. And then when uh, hard times come, they will fall away. And then there are those who hear it, but I, I got to do this, this, and this. The cares of this world. The little G God of this world is Satan. Do you fear him or the Lord? Are you being defiled by the king's meat? Go to Ephesians now. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Okay? More proof to you. More proof to you. That who is a king over all the children of pride? Satan. Who has been given, as we looked at? Given by whom? Our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Satan has been allowed to be ruler over the earth as a judgment upon it. Okay? Our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, is in control, is in control of everything. But he has given it on to Satan. Okay? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. Where in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. You hear the gospel and reject it, you're a child of disobedience. Okay? This is not referring to those of the church of the living God who have messed up or have some... No. A child of disobedience is one who rejects the gospel. Okay? And go to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. This is what we have to remember. Hi. This is what I got to remember. Ephesians chapter 6, verse, uh, verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, 
against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. It's a spiritual battle. And the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting away all imaginations that exalt itself above the word of God. I just paraphrased that. Okay? This is our weapon, the sword of the spirit. Okay? This is how we fight. We fight on our knees in prayer. But we have to remember that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. What does that mean? The Jesuits rule the world right now. Satan has been allowed to be the little G-God of this world. Okay? Okay? And the Jesuits work for Satan. All right? It's the Jesuits that are in control. They're in the higher places. Those who have aligned themselves with them. Okay? The spiritual wickedness in high places is Satanism. Satan himself. And we wrestle not against flesh and blood. I have to remember that as well as you. Okay? Okay? Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Verses 1 on to verse 4. Okay? Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 on to verse 4. Wherefore, seeing we are also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now remember, the book of Hebrews is a time of Jacob's trouble epistle. But this is for our instruction in righteousness. Don't compromise. Do not conform. What is it worth? But let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. We will be rewarded for cleaving unto our Lord Jesus Christ rather than fearing men. For consider him that endured such contradiction of himself, of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. What does this mean? Verse 3. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. He is God the Father. He could not, cannot sin. And what does it say? For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Well, God our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, was walking on the earth. Uh, think about this, dear brother, sister. He could read minds. He knew what thoughts were going through people's heads. Utterly pure, holy, separate, other. He could not sin. In him was no sin. And he endured with us. And you and I are fallible. Remember that. Remember that. Because, go to James chapter 4 now. Oh, you're going to love this. James chapter 4. James chapter 4. Verse 7 on to verse 10. 
Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Fear the Lord. The fear of Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. And hold your place here before we continue. Go to Romans chapter 12. We have to look at that. Okay. This is for our instruction in righteousness, looking in James and Hebrews. But Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Come on, fingers work with me. 1 and 2 in Romans chapter 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable, for, uh, reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Go back to James. Chapter 4, verse 7 on verse 10. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Uh, resisting the devil is hinged on what? Submitting yourself, therefore, to God. Unless you submit yourself unto the Lord, how are you going to resist the devil? Riddle me that. Beg your pardon. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Who are you afraid of? If you're compromising and conforming, you're not afraid of the Lord, are you? Are you? Now go to Mark. Go to Mark. Go back to Mark, excuse me. Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, verses 34 on to verse 38. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same will save it. The same shall save it. Here's what you need to really ponder and ask yourself. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Wherefore, whosoever therefore, excuse me, shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. Now we have to remember the dispensational difference here. Okay? Today, if you are saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God, okay, you are sealed unto the day of redemption. What we're going to be talking about now has nothing to do with your salvation, you evil, disgusting devils. Okay? Okay? Do you understand that? Okay? Look at me. Read my lips. What we are looking at now is not talking about your salvation. Okay? Okay? Because if you are truly saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God, 
You are sealed unto the day of redemption. Eternally secure, once saved, always saved. Okay, you're going to heaven if you are truly saved. This has nothing to do with your salvation. Do you understand? Huh? Do you understand? If we deny him, he will deny us. Hmm? If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Go find that. That's in, what is that? First or second Timothy. You go find that. You go find that. When you compromise, you're afraid. You're afraid of men. The Lord would not have you to compromise and go contrary to his word. Okay? He would not. He would not. Because he has uh, exalted his word above his own name. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Okay? And look at this. Verse 38. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. Now you got to remember, dispensationally when he said this, this was before the crucifixion, okay? While he was offering the kingdom of heaven unto the Jewish people, okay? Okay? And after the death, burial, and resurrection, after that began this dispensation, the time of the Gentiles, okay? Okay? And this dispensation, we are saved by grace through faith. And once you are truly saved, you are sealed until the day of redemption. Okay. Sorry if I sound like a broken record, but these devil twits uh, will, will take this, cut this out and say that I'm preaching against eternal security. Okay. Which, no, no. This is our instruction on in righteousness. When you compromise... You're fearing man. Think about this, brother, sister. When you compromise, think about this. Go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 on to verse 17. Of Romans chapter 1. Now let's read verses 14 on to verse 17. Beg your pardon. I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So, as much as it in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Uh, of Christ, they take out of the modern Bibles, by the way, usually. Not all of them, but some of them. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first, and also to the Greek. A Greek is a Gentile. Okay? For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, just shall live by faith. What does that mean? Very quickly. From faith to faith. Faith in what God will do versus Faith of what God has done. Okay? From faith to faith. From faith in the law. From faith unto Christ. What, the God, what God will do versus what God has done. Okay? Verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Hath not our Lord set you free, Church of the Living God? Hmm? Beg your pardon. Beg your pardon. Hath he not set you free from this world? And you're going to compromise? 
Are you ashamed of the Lord? Well, no, I'm not. Yeah. Who are you afraid of then? Have you proposed in your heart that you will not be defiled by the king's meat? Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 on verse 6. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, that the power of God might rest upon us in our tribulations to be witnesses unto those who see that. Get it? <gasps> Knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us himself, our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, and the Lord is that Spirit. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. You're not ashamed of the Lord, are you? I understand some of you might be afraid to speak up I get that. But when you're compromising and going against the scripture, and fearing men, instead of, you know, cleaving onto the word of our Lord Jesus Christ, um, Are you ashamed of the Lord? Romans chapter 9, verse 33. Check this out. Oh, yeah, y'all gonna love this. Romans chapter 9, verse 33. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Romans 10, verses 8 on to verse 13. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even, even in thy mouth, and in thine heart, in, and in thy heart, that is, the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart, that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him for what he has done for you, because of what you did to him, shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In verse 14, you idiot, I say that with charity, is talking about those who are sent out to preach the word. Okay? You idiot. I'm not going to be nice about that. Okay? If you just read that and verse 15, it's talking about those who are sent out to preach. Okay? Yes. Those of us at the Church of the Living God deal quite well with verse 14 and 15, you idiot. Okay? It's talking about those who are sent out to preach. That's what that's talking about. But see, they like to divert away from the main argument by focusing on something as believe 
while subtracting away from the truth of verse 14 and 15 that it's talking about those who preach, while they center on the word believe to distract away from the main truth of the two verses. Very, very similar to the tactics that that one little girl in the video that was done yesterday that I linked does herself. Is what these devils do. They take away from the truth of 14 and 15 that's talking about those who go out to preach and center on believe. Taking away from the truth of the, those two verses that it's about those who go out and speak, it, speak the word and preach. You idiots. And I'm not going to apologize for saying that of these devils who go, oh, they don't deal with 14 and 15. Shut up. Shut up. Go to 2 Timothy now. 2 Timothy. Verse 1. Chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 6, on to verse 12. Uh, not 2 Timothy, excuse me, uh, not 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, beg your pardon. <laughs> 2 Timothy chapter 6, on to verse 12. Wherefore? I put thee in remembrance that thou stir that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the word of God. According to the power of God, excuse me, who has saved us and called us with an holy separate than other than calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given uh, us in Christ Jesus before the world began. It's not Calvinism. Okay. The way of the cross was chosen from the beginning of the world wasn't revealed unto uh, uh, people until Paul, okay? They weren't looking forward to the cross in Genesis and whatnot. I've already talked about that and covered that before, okay? But the way of the cross was chosen from the very beginning. Yes, it was. It wasn't revealed until much, 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 years and years and years and years and years and years and years later, okay? <laughs> so. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an, ap and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed. How about you? And am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. I know whom I have believed. What about you? Do you have, you, you know, do you do like the metaphysical mind science kind of stuff, having faith in your faith? Do you believe in your belief? Or do you believe on our Lord Jesus Christ, the man, Christ Jesus, for what he did for you on the cross because of what you did to him to put him on that cross? See, if you have faith in your faith, then your faith isn't on Jesus Christ. Oh, really? Yeah, if you have belief in your belief, your belief is not in uh, the fact that he died for your sins according to the scriptures. No, your belief is in your belief. <laughs> that's, a, that's fleshly. That's not from heaven. That's sensual, devil, devilish, led by your senses. 
Okay? You know that devil, Phil Robertson, who's a water dog, okay? Campbellite, I believe he is. He did that, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Of course, he reads in Nutty Idiot's version, okay? Phil Robertson is going to be ashamed at the great white throne of judgment. Many people out there think that guy's a safe man. <clears throat> Choose to suffer over than compromising. Because it's going to be worth it, brethren. It's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. John chapter 16. We're almost done. John chapter 16. John chapter 16. This is one. On to verse 3. Okay? We gotta remember that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, that it's a spiritual battle. And that who is our enemy? Satan and his army, the Jesuits, and all these Christians, these Christians, okay? Who are very quick to compromise and call you the enemy for adhering to the scriptures. Okay? Don't be ashamed of that. Stand by the scriptures. Cleave unto our Lord. Trust in him. No matter what it costs you. Don't be defiled by the king's meat. Don't bow down to their gods. And when the writing and decree is written against you for praying unto our Lord Jesus Christ, for going out there, witnessing unto the lost through the scriptures, have your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because what said the scriptures? John 16, verses 1 on to verse 3. These things have I spoken unto you that ye should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father nor me. One and the same. Jesus Christ has got the Father. Now you got to remember again, this is before the crucifixion, but the instruction in righteousness is. You're not a Christian, if you don't think of the common good, do this, do this, and go against the scriptures in the name of unity. And you look at the Tower of Babel. What happens when everybody gets together? They decide to make themselves a tower thinking that they're gods. God's a God of distinction. God likes things over there where he put them. He wants things over there where he put them. He likes separation and distinction. Because what happened? Look at, look at the Tower of Babel, people. Which Roman Catholicism refers to as the Error of Babel. <laughs> Meaning the dispersion. Pick your pardon. And they know not the Father nor our Lord Jesus Christ, one and the same. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Jesus is God the Father. They don't know that because they believe in three gods. Okay? But they will say, you're not, you're not a Christian because you're not thinking of the common good. You're not compromising in order to make peace. Amen, buddy. Go to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. Verses 29 and 30. Let's read 28 and 30. In Mark chapter 10. Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, 
We have left all and followed thee. See, we have. And Jesus answered and said, Verily, I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake, and the gospels. But he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time, houses, and brethren, and sisters, and mothers, and children, and lands, with persecutions. And in the world to come, eternal life. You'll get all that back, and it's worth it, but you'll get it with persecution. Because all who will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And it's not like you have to go out of your way. You just have to simply live according to the scriptures. And then the accusers, they, 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 they line up to go after you. Because you refuse to compromise. You would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of our God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. See. First Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4. Verses 12 on to 19. First Peter chapter 4, verses 12 on to verse 19. <laughs> uh, remember Daniel chapter 3 that we already looked at? Yeah? Okay. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a, <laughs> a murderer <laughs> or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. <laughs> Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Peter was saying, you know, if you're going to suffer as what they labeled us as a Christian, what does it say there? But let him glorify God on this behalf. Meaning, you call me a Christian, but I'm of the church of the living God, and I'm going to die as such. He wasn't saying in verse 16, that it's okay to call us that. No. That's what they called us. And this has already been proven. We did not call ourselves Christians. They called us that. And this verse right there, which those of you who will not drop that terminology like to cling to, hey, 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 hey. Okay? If you want to cling to that, fine. There again, personally, the distinction part is very important to me. How about you? But anyway, he's not saying it's okay to call yourselves that. If you're going to die as being labeled that, it's better than dying as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, busybody. That's the comparison. Better to die being labeled as a Christian rather than a murderer, a thief, and so on and so forth. Not that that's what they called themselves. That's not what we called ourselves ever. Except nowadays for some reason. In the scriptures, it wasn't so. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? 
judging yourself. Hi. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Right here, brethren. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit their keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. O ye of little faith. Are you defiled by the king's meat? Or have you proposed in your heart to not be defiled by the king's meat? Fear man bringeth a snare, but whosoever putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Who do you fear? When the rubber hits the road, dear brethren. When the rubber hits the road, where are you going to stand? You can say all you can say, but what happens when that situation is upon you? What do you do? Job 13, verse 15. You may lose it all. Your address might have to be your vehicle. But there again, you don't think the Lord's going to provide for you? The Lord who can furnish a table in the wilderness... The Lord who took myself and my wife from the vile secular workforce and put us where we are to work for him. You don't think the Lord can take care of you? Job 13 verse 15. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him but I will maintain mine own ways before him. Not mine own ways that I come up with, no. But I may, will maintain mine own ways before him. Whether he slay me or whatever, I'll trust in him because his ways are not my ways, nor are my thoughts his thoughts. And I will walk according to the scriptures. It is that serious, brethren. It is that serious. There are those of you of the Church of the Living God that are far, far greater than I am. That young man who has proposed in his heart, that, that's something, brother. That's something. That's something that I could never have done. <laughs> Hence, okay? Who has proposed in his heart to keep himself pure. That, that's a testimony, brother. Especially nowadays, you walk outside your door, okay? And sexuality is just pumped at you, isn't it? I commend you, brother. I commend any brother, any sister who say, never mind, give me Jesus, give me Jesus. Only to thy cross I cling. Only unto thee, Lord Jesus Christ, Father. pray. Bow your head. Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, my Lord, our God, thank you for this day. Thank you for providing your provision. Thank you for furnishing a table in the wilderness. And my Lord, our God, our Father, there are those out there who are having their, foot, their feet put to the fire right now. May you comfort and console them. May 
the fear of you, Lord, be in every single one of your body, the church of the living God, the ground and pillar of the truth. May we stay firm unto the end. Even though the writing is written against us, that we bow down, not, that we not bow down, excuse me, unto their gods. But let us propose in our hearts not to be defiled by the king's meat. And Lord, may you reward every single brother and sister who will cleave unto you unto the very end. Merciful Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, in Jesus' name. God's people said amen. I wanted to add one verse that I forgot about. Go to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. And we'll close it here. Revelation chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Roman Catholicism. They say they are Jews. They have replaced the Jews. Hence, they don't outwardly say they are Jewish. But remember, the time of Jacob's trouble is not for Jacob. It's for the church. Hence, replacement theology. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. Prove thy servants for ten days, like we saw in Daniel. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. It's going to be it for this video. Thank you so much, Church of the Living God, Body of Christ, our brothers and sisters. We love you and are praying for so very many of you. Thank you very much for watching if you do. We will see you in the next video.